Hey everybody, welcome to the Ron Line Report. Today's guest I haven't spoken to in a very long time. Always love talking to him. Can't wait to catch up. Please welcome Sergio Oliva Jr. How are you, Sergio? Good. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it. Yeah. So I, I got my facts straight on where you've lived. In the U.S., you've lived in four states so far. Illinois, that's where you're originally from. You've lived in California. You've lived in Florida. You lived in North Carolina. You've also lived in three countries outside the U.S., Australia, Dubai, and most recently Spain. So my first question is, if you could live in any country, is there any country you've lived in so far that you would rather live in than the U.S.? Like, I like this better than the U.S. Um, no, everything's got its plus and minuses, but the convenience in America makes a lot of things outside of the country hard to live with if you were born and raised in the States, where I think it would be different if like you were born and raised in, in Europe and then came to the States, you can transition going back. But just like little things, trying to get shit done, business, packages, calling businesses in Spain was just really hard. But where I lived in Spain is probably the closest to San Diego. And I would say San Diego is probably the best place I've lived. Okay, fair enough. Bodybuilding, you know, bodybuilding aside, like mm -hmm. nothing to do with bodybuilding. You've been in Vegas for how long? About six weeks now? Uh, no, I think it's a little bit more than two months now. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. How are you liking Vegas so far? Yeah, I actually really like it. Um, it's a lot better than I thought, actually. I think a lot of us, I'm sure you included, we just come for the Olympia and we leave, you know, or we come party with some friends and we leave. I've never even been to anybody's house. You know, I feel like I've never been to Nevada, you know, like that's the best way I can describe it. I've only just been to the strip. Um, so now being able to be, you know, immersed in the neighborhoods and uh, the gyms, you know, not just like whatever's just the host gym for the Olympia where it's super crowded and everybody's at. It's really cool to really see the real Vegas. And uh, it's actually really good. Uh, everything happens for a reason. I obviously, you know. A lot happened to me in Dubai and traveling, and I learned a lot, and I got a lot out of that. So, you know, I can't say that uh, I wish I didn't go there, but I wish I kind of moved here sooner, actually, to hmm. tell you the truth. Hmm. Now, I remember we were texting a, a little bit to set this up, and you know, I, I said I couldn't live there because of the heat, and you said this is nothing compared to Dubai. Dubai gets to like 125 degrees every damn day. Yeah, right now, uh, I think it's like it's supposed to like feel like 130 something. But it's humid. It's the humidity. So I'll take a dry heat all day. Um, even if it was the same temperature, I would take a dry heat. Uh, as you said, I lived in Florida. I lived in Florida eight years. So that humidity, I mean, I mean, people get used to it when you're there, but it's just something that like you just feel like you have to shower twice a day you like leave the house and you could literally feel it like a blanket wrap over your body of the uh of that humidity so that's how it was in dubai and and then now add in right extreme high temperatures compared to florida it's just unlivable really in the summer and that's why everybody who lives there they leave during the summer like in, as a like a snowbirds we have you know like people who leave during the winter they leave during the summer and then actually it's the most packed in dubai uh during the winter so it's like a weird thing because like me like i don't like the heat but i hate people more than the heat so so everyone's favorite everyone's favorite time of dubai is the winter but i hated it the most because it is just such a mass overcrowding of people um that i i mean i i probably in my life too i think just because when we're, when you're a bodybuilder it's not like you're like spending a lot of time outside hanging out doing doing anything really other than the gym so i really was just going home and going to the gym so the things that affected me is like traffic and coming from leaving la you know i left la i mean i left la for several reasons but going from just la to san diego which is just two hours difference it is like your completely different uh place for traffic so being back in dubai and the traffic is even worse than the 405 in la oh it's just uh you can't even describe it wow yeah, I mean, the reason I talk about the weather so much is because I know you grew up in a very cold, a place that has serious winters. Chicago is like three blocks away from Canada. So someone that's <laughs> used to winters and used to change the seasons, like I, I, I just couldn't live in these places you've lived. I, I would, I'd be miserable. So I give it up to you for able to, being able to just tolerate these high temperatures, even from, I know you're not out all day, like, uh, you know, playing Frisbee or anything out in the, in the heat, but still, yikes. All right. Uh, yeah, no, it is. It is crazy. And 
you know, it's different. It's different when you you visit. You know, everybody asks me how's Dubai and everything to visit. Everything's amazing. Even visiting Chicago in the winter is amazing. You know, you miss snow. It's when you are there for a long time. And you know how it is, too. Like, once you know you're not leaving, even, even if you've only been there, like, a few weeks, but because you know you're never leaving because you moved there, yeah. things are a little bit different. So, like, if I went back to Chicago to visit friends or go back for the holidays for Christmas, it's great because I know I'm leaving. But if something switched that I knew that I was stuck there, it would, everything would be bothering me. <laughs> All right, let's 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 move on to what I am just so fascinated with because I was a huge Dorian Yates fan. I knew him from talking to him every month for MD for several years. I got to train. He trained me just twice, you know, nothing compared to what you've been, you were able to experience. But uh, I got so much out of just those two sessions. So I, I want to start with asking you, how did that all, how did that all begin? Did you, you move to Marbella? Spain just to be with him. How did that all come about? Well, I didn't move just to be with him. It was just kind of like a thing, like an added bonus. Uh, no matter what, I was getting out of Dubai. I definitely was done with that shithole and how they do things. And, um, you know, it's just like, you know, once I, w once I was in the jail um, and even out of the jail and they put me on that travel ban, you really got to see how Dubai really was so i no matter what i was just burned out with that and as me and you have talked several times i probably the biggest disgrace to the cuban people not speaking spanish so <laughs> it's something that's just bothered me for a long time so i wanted to move to a spanish-speaking country uh and i actually almost moved to mexico um wow and then really just came down to where the gyms are not that great and um it just it wasn't going to be the best for the career um and then i just it's, it's just how life works i ran into somebody who i knew when i lived in venice of all places he went to the gold's gym he was in dubai and he's like man you live in san diego you should go check out marbella in spain it's the closest thing to san diego there's even a san diego right next to marbella san huh. diego spain and uh it is it literally is exactly the same except that they speak spanish um so that was a selling point for me. So me and my girlfriend, we went to, to go check out the area. And honestly, even if Dorian wasn't there, I probably still would have moved there because it oh, was wow. just so it was so beautiful. It really was nice. And it was very opposite of Dubai and still being kind of very chill compared to the States. But while I was there, I went to lunch with Dorian and then we talked about training. And I knew that I would probably train once or twice, you know, here or there with him. I wasn't I didn't I never want to ask anyone, especially retired guys to like. Mm -hmm commit fully to you know trying to prepare especially him he's never even worked with any pros before not any open pros you know maybe some you know guys in the uk or something but not not actual bodybuilders not big guys so you could tell that he was very excited about it too um i mean i don't know how long people have followed the sport that uh, watch your show but dorian's son got into bodybuilding uh for a little bit um and then that didn't work out. And I think that that was something that he really wanted to do, but he's just not going to force someone to do something. He's not going to baby anyone. So it ended up not working out and his son went a different direction. So I think it was kind of cool for him to kind of do something kind of father son together, help me train me. Um, so, so yeah, no, I wasn't even uh, moving there for him. I just knew that I would probably train here or there with him. But when he was just so excited and kind of on board and even mapping out a plan, and the thing that I respect the most is he was even calling, I have a new coach now, I'm with Neil Hill, and he was even having conversations with Neil about my plan, which is a very rare thing to do, especially on Mr. Olympia. Uh, they're not really going to discuss anything with anyone else. That's just going to be my way, and that's how it is. So that was really cool. Obviously, Neil, you know, uh, has a lot of respect uh, for Dorian, as everyone does. So that was really cool. Huh. Yeah. I mean, it, you, you said it exactly. I mean, <clears throat> Dorian doesn't even really follow the sport anymore. I don't <laughs> think. I mean, he just doesn't. He's beyond it. It's, he's moved on and with his life and into other things. So when I saw that he was training you, I was really dumbfounded. I was like, wow. You know, it really showed so – it says something – it says a lot about you that he would, out of all the open bodybuilders out there, he took a special interest in you and wanted to see what he could do with you. Um, and I, I can't see him doing that with anybody else, to be honest with you. I really can't. Yeah, literally, Zach Khan is the only pro that he's ever worked with. That's right. That's right. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to ask about the – you were – a standard volume trainer, I'm assuming, your entire yeah. life up to that point, right? Yeah, super high volume. I'll train for like two and a half hours. Ooh. So 
did you have to sit down with Dorian and like be de deprogrammed like a like someone that coming out of a cult would be? How did you how did he convince you to that this would be something to try this? Because I most people I look at it and I've even done it. I'm like, ah, that's crazy. That's not enough, even though as intense as it is. So yeah, what was your initial reaction or thought process entering into the Dorian Yates HIT blood and guts? Um, I mean, it was the same as it is when I trained with anyone. You know, I lived, Tom Platz lived with me, trained with Cormier, Milos, Charles Glass. I mean, my workout partners for a little bit were Sean Roden and Dexter. So, like, I've literally trained with everyone in all different types of training. So, I'm not really stuck in one way, uh, even though I might prefer one over the other. But I'm able to be a sponge and obviously training with him and just his voice alone, the nostalgia. <laughs> Uh, nostalgia of his voice could have made me enter a hot dog eating contest, you know, it, no matter what it, what it would have been. So it was very easy to transition for that. It was just hard, like you said, to stop myself from doing a little bit extra. Um, but I also, you know, I also didn't plan that I was going to be moving. I didn't know that I was going to have to have visa issues. And I also didn't know that I was going to get injured. So I just kind of had it in my head that we're going to prep to the show that I'm going to qualify for the Olympia. And then we're going to prep to the Olympia. So what I need to do is, and it's the same thing I'm doing with Neil is I'm going to do exactly everything that they're saying to the T because when I do do a show and maybe something doesn't go the way I want it to, God forbid, I can say I did exactly the way it was. A lot of bodybuilders listen to too many people. They change things. And then you start to now question, you know, did I overtrain? Did I do this? Because my problem is not, not training too little it's training too much you know i i do too much cardio i do too much training i stress too much about stuff so uh it was just easy to kind of turn it off and just let him handle it um and uh but yeah going from two and a half hours to 45 minutes to an hour is a, is a really big difference um but exactly i just felt like i was in blood and guts and anyone who has been a fan of the sport for you know as long as i have it it was just it was like you were in that movie and i almost felt like i was back in his gym uh in in in, in um england and we just weren't we were just in a nicer area in, in spain so i'm curious does he did he train you the way I, I i don't know how he trains people now i don't know if it's exactly what he used to do he used to only train four days a week on a four-way split everything got hit once a week and every exercise was work you know you'd he would do warm-ups but he only did one really all out top set. Is, is that what he had you doing? Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Um, he even said that he, you know, I wouldn't have known this if he didn't tell me, he let me do a little, a uh, couple extra sets uh, because usually it's just kind of like a, a little bit of a warm up, and then right away into a, you know your almost your heaviest working set, and then maybe one more, and he helps you with like some force reps or negatives and stuff like that. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know if it's because I'm a little bit heavier, older, whatever it is. But it takes me a little bit to actually keep uh, to warm up, and I need to keep doing a little bit more sets in between. Um, it's weird. Like I've, uh, it's been like this my whole life. If like if I do, if I do a set of you know whatever it is, and let's say that I want to jump up like two or three plates, it's almost like my joints automatically take over, and I'm not even using the muscle at all. Mm -hmm. So. It's weird because most people, and that's exactly what his uh, theory is, is, you know, you're wasting energy on these sets where if I don't have those, you know, one or two sets in between, uh, I actually do worse. So sometimes giving me, you know, an extra set in between, I'm going to end up being able to go way heavier and connect with the muscle a, a lot better and have better stamina. It's weird. I don't even know uh, how it makes sense. Um, but so that was cool. That was nice of him. It, it, it took a little bit to get him to do that. Uh, but I think he started seeing like, I wasn't bullshitting. Um, I think it was very hard for him to work with someone who has done the Olympia, you know, let alone a pro because he does all his certifications. He trains, you know, so many people all over the world, but how much do they really know their body, you know? And then when they say something to him, if I was him, I would think the same thing. Like, you don't know shit. You don't know what you're talking about, you know, where I've trialed and errored for 15 years now, you know, so I've been doing this for a long time. So I think after a while he started seeing like, oh, you know what? We on, on incline bench, you know, we start with, 
you know, he'd want to start with like 225 and I'd be like, you know, please, please let me just start with 135. My, my shoulder would love to start with 135, <laughs> even if I just did a couple and, you know, he would let me do that, but then he'd want to go straight to 315, you know, or something like that. And I think once he realized if I just did 135, 225, 315, and then four plates, I'm doing way more reps with that heaviest set than I would if we jumped to it really fast. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, he, he kind of wavered a little bit, but, but for the most part, he kind of, he, he stuck to, he stuck to his guns and, and, uh, his way is, is the right way. Um, you know, we would have discussions about certain things that I've just realized you're not going to be able to change, um, their mind. Uh, it's the same thing, kind of like how my dad was. There's nothing you can say to a Mr. Olympia, um, to change what they think about training, but no matter what, if they agree or not, the criteria for bodybuilding is a lot different since 1996 or seven. Sure. I think was the last time he did it on Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Uh, glutes are very important. Um, you need to do adductors. Um, so whenever I would want to do like some adductors or glutes or lunges, just, you know, certain exercises that are hitting those uh, crucial um, points that the judges are looking at, he would say no. Hmm. Uh, that, that's that's not uh, important. Hmm. So besides that, besides me knowing that these judges are going to be looking for certain muscles and, and also, too, I mean, I can tell you this, you, you know, the posing is different. They would stick their butt back, spike the calf yeah. and the glutes would usually be a little bit, you know, soft. Uh, they would kind of flex them. But now we do most of our hips in squeezing the glutes. Yeah. Um, it does change the way your back looks. I think old school posing is better. I completely agree with the old ways, but I unfortunately have to compete in today's day. So, so the lines in your ass are important. Um, it, it does, it does matter. And as stupid as some kickbacks or lunges might be, uh, they are, they are, uh, very important. So other than that, uh, it was really great. And I just feel like because people want to ask me who's is this better is that better like no matter what any kind of shock or uncomfortability or anything like that you're growing you have to be growing mm. because even if like i say like i didn't like that training or i didn't prefer it you know it, it was painful that has to equal out to something um so i just wish that i i didn't get injured so he was he would travel a lot he goes back and forth to obviously uh the uk and to brazil a lot they would go to brazil sometimes for like a month uh him and his wife yeah. so there'd be times that they'd be traveling and then i would have to hop in whenever he's in town and then it just happened to be where he was gone for like a month and i was just killing it doing what he taught me while he was gone and then literally a couple of days right before he got back i got injured so i wasn't able to train with him and then it was just it was just one of those things where i just i hurt my ankle so i couldn't do lower body and i hurt my shoulder so i couldn't do upper body mm -hmm. um and, you know, of course, he's, you know, wants to tell me about him training in a sling when he tore his bicep. <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've, I've also trained. I have plenty of pictures on my social media where I'm in the gym with a, with a sling on, too. It's just different when I'm training like I injured my left leg. My left leg is way smaller than my right leg. So me going in and doing my, my right leg by itself is only going to be detrimental to me um, going in and just doing half of my upper body. But I also wanted to make sure that. I'm just letting it recover. I didn't want to be one of those guys because I also am very aware that I'm 39 and I can't just be like, okay, I'll suck it up and, you know, and I'll do this. And I was trying to explain to him, like when he, when he kept training, when he was injured, it was just a bicep and he still had Mr. Olympia chest, Mr. Olympia back, Mr. Olympia legs. So him entering a show still, it, it was doable. There's no point with me lagging in a lot of areas. I moved to fix, move there to fix these areas and then just hop into a show, not any better than I was my last show. It just, it, it wasn't going to be worth it. So unfortunately that's how it ended. And then I was fighting for the visa for a long time. I talked to a bunch of lawyers and they were telling me that uh, if I stayed any longer, because I actually overstayed a lot, like oh. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you're allowed like 120 days total for the year. And uh, I was I was there for way longer, um, but then they can ban you for four years. So so of course he's just like, yeah, just stay, you know, fuck <laughs> it. And uh, and honestly, if I if I didn't have the new sponsors that I have, 
it's 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 kind of like ironic how I have these European sponsors because I moved to Europe. Now I'm sponsored by trained by JP and I'm sponsored by Jim 80 equipment, which is in Germany. And I only got those sponsors because I was out there and I was able to meet certain people and train with those machines and go to FIBO and stuff like that. But if I get banned now, I cannot go to FIBO. I cannot go to Germany. You know, I can't leave Spain. And no matter what, let's say that I finish it out. We do the show. I qualify for the Olympia. Uh, now, as soon as I leave for the Olympia, I definitely cannot come back. And I would only be able to do shows. We were even trying to plan about me driving to Portugal, sneaking through the border because they don't even have any border patrol. So either way, like I, I, I swear that I tried to yeah. stay and finish that, especially because it didn't end on like, you know, we were training and then the visa happened. And I left. We were training and I got injured, lost all the games that I had got and then had to leave. So it, it, it sucked. But. Um, I honestly learned so much from him. Obviously, I, I learned stuff with training that I'm going to use forever, but also just kind of being just a human being. Uh, anyone who's followed Dorian knows that he is the happiest he's ever been. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's so crazy to think you could be the king of the world, you know, for six years straight, and you are more happy now, half the size, du almost double the age, you know, and uh, there's just – a lot of things that he has figured out in life and uh, I'm really happy that I learned those more. It sounds so crazy to go and train with the shadow, but I'm able to handle stresses. I mean, able to handle adversity a lot better because of him more than I can say what I got in the gym muscle wise. Mm. That, that's funny because, you know, I knew him back when he was competing, but I, I he was sort of unapproachable and he kind of struck me as like a miserable bastard. You know, yeah, I don't he was. mean like a bad person, but he was just so, so, so focused on what he was doing at the time. I don't think he was enjoying his life. It was just worrying about the next show, the next prep, this and that. And, you know, I've got, I got to know him later after he'd retired. And it's a completely different person, completely different person. Yeah, but he'll tell you the same thing, too, that he was miserable, and he felt like the more miserable he was, the better he did. He would live separately with his girlfriend. Like, he literally would just shut himself off from the rest of the world. Um, so, yeah, I think I think his – obviously, his life is better, but even his relationships are better. Even his relationships with his family are better because, yeah, if, if someone has the mentality that the more shut off and the more – uh you know kind of yeah, yeah that i'm gonna do better then other people are gonna kind of take that as like an offense especially if you you love him and you're a family member so mm -hmm. it's really cool he's going everywhere with his daughter now his his son had a, a child so he's a he's a grandfather now so he is loving being that new um i guess position because one thing i've learned growing up in the sport is a lot especially the mr olympias they don't know how to handle being done with competing. And I get it, you know, like even we get it, you know, you fall off, you get injured and people look at you and it's just like, oh, you know, what happened? Or someone comments, oh, he's lost so much size. I understand that that's the only way a majority of people know us is through our muscles. So when you don't have them, you start to feel like, I watched this like documentary on the riding giants, the big wave surfer and Laird Hamilton was like, it's like being a dragon slayer. And then you have no more dragons to slay. Like you mm -hmm. just have no purpose in life. And then you see a lot of them start to like, feel bad about themselves. My dad died very unhappy, very, very embarrassed with himself. And why? Because you're almost 70 years old and you don't look like a Mr. Olympia anymore. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, it's one of those things where who's going to tell him he's wrong. You know, he, of course, he's going to feel that. And how are you not going to feel that? So it was just such a um, it was just such like a, a breath of fresh air to be around someone who is not only OK, but they're better. And they understand that that's something that I did. You know, I used to race race cars and now I'm perfectly fine riding a bike and I get a lot of joy out of that. Um, so that was really that was really cool because it is scary to grow up in this sport and see a guy who won, you know, Mr. Olympia's beat Arnold and die so miserable and so unhappy for things that were just so stupid. My dad was so upset about some skin on his neck. That, that was one of the last things I remember him complaining about and being ashamed. He stopped going to expos because of it. And if you look at all the shows that he went to, he would wear sunglasses because he was worried about the bags under his eyes. And look, you have those things and you're like 50. Okay. He is like, he's 70 and he was the guinea pig of all this. Like they literally had to figure out what drugs, what exercises off of fucking up, 
You take too many of those drugs, okay, you take less. You know, you, this machine or this exercise is not good. I got injured. Okay, we'll do this one. So to be all beaten up and, and not look like a reigning Mr. Olympia makes sense. And it's scary to get into the sport and start to think, like, am I going to have this whole, you know, depression phase where I'm so upset with myself, but it's really cool to be around him. Dennis Wolf is out here. Dennis Wolf is probably an eighth of the size that he used to be. And you see him, he's loving life. He's skydiving. He's jumping off of cliffs, you know? And of course, it's great to see them living their lives. But when you have a conversation with them and they are completely happy and they're working on other businesses and they're also paying it forward and helping other bodybuilders. And I think that that's a huge thing that a lot of Mr. Olympias don't do. And it's not because they don't want to. It's just because they're dealing with their own um, self-conscious issues that the last thing that they're going to think about is being more in the limelight mm -hmm. and putting themselves out there more when you should just not care about that shit. And you should be trying to teach all of us coming up what not to do. Um, so it, it, it was, it was really cool to be around someone who was just really so happy in life. There's just a couple more questions about the Dorian thing. I don't want to move on, but I, I've, I, he said that people make gains on each on his system. And I believe that probably part of that is because maybe they were overtrained or maybe it's just the difference with having all that extra, just having all that extra recovery time and less frequency of body part training. What kind of gains did you experience in the time that you were training with him? Yeah, it was so short that I, I was I was most of the time trying to put the weight back on that I had lost from Dubai. Wow. So you know how it is, too, when you were like at a certain level and then you lost and then now you're starting to get back to that level again, like even by training with someone new with a different training style. Someone asked me, you know, exactly, you know, how were the gains the whole time? I was just upset because I wasn't where I was in Dubai. So I never weighed myself. I never was able to look at myself in the mirror and say that I looked as good as I did when I was in Dubai. Dubai is the best I ever looked before mm -hmm. I got locked up was the best I've ever looked in my entire life. So it's just one of those things where I was just never happy and I was never satisfied. But I do think that obviously if I kept going, uh, I would have been able to see different changes, especially in my back mm -hmm. um, with legs. The, the biggest difference was he goes completely all out with leg extensions first yeah. and then you squ and then you squat i've never done that before i always i warm up on leg extensions but i save them for the end when i go heavy oh. so i probably would have got something from completely fatiguing my uh my quads and then doing all the uh, compound movements but for the most part i train shoulders by myself i train chest by myself uh the back stuff definitely the stuff that he showed me I think we would eventually saw some really great thickness because of the form that he taught me. Um, I mean, you, you have this Nautilus pullover in any gym, you're going to get gains. Uh, yeah. But, but you know, I've done the, I mean, how many of us have done that pullover, even if it's just a shitty one in a gym, how many times do you pull it and you hold it? I never have because it's so hard. It's so hard on like your stomach. It's so hard on your joints. And that just means you need to go lighter. And, and I always just thought like, you know, if I'm doing it and can even touch my stomach, then I'm doing it right. But I never held it. And that was something that I definitely learned from him. So I think I would have got a lot of gains. But unfortunately, with uh, getting injured and then the on and off training with him, I never really got that much. Yeah. You know, I, like I said, I only trained there a couple of times. But I remember at the end of the session thinking I could never, ever train like this on my own. I think, you know, we all think we train very hard. And, you know, I'm sure at a certain level like you're at, of course you train hard. You wouldn't look like that if you didn't. But the way he pushes you, I don't think it's you could duplicate that on your own. Have you have you tried to train that style on your own without him? No, because also, I mean, obviously his force wraps and the, you know, where he does the negative or you do the negative and then he'll he'll lift it for you, you know, stuff like that. Uh, you're not going to get, obviously, unless somebody knows what they're doing. But honestly, there were so many times that I'm dead about to pass out you know i'll never quit but you're mentally checking out and that voice that, that voice puts energy stamina inside of you and i think that probably would have made me grow the most yeah. um and also too i mean obviously his voice is, is like i said it's, it's very nostalgic but i don't want to let anyone down that's taking the time to train me especially mm -hmm. someone i know who's never taken any time on their own because this guy he wakes up he does the cold bath he does like an ice plunge he goes for a bike ride you know he'll smoke he'll chill do yoga pilates he'll train three times maybe a week with weights 
the last thing that this guy wants to be doing is going and taking weights off and mm. spotting me, you know, having some sweaty ass dude drenched <laughs> all over him. So every minute that I knew that he was in the gym with me, I was just so appreciative that that if he said 10 more and I'm passing out, then I'm going to try and do 10 more, you know, so th that was really great. But what you were saying is, is this better? Is that better? We'll never know because he never changed his training, but you're going to tell me that if he did this training his whole entire life, and then let's say that he trained some high volume, some drop sets, some supersets, he wouldn't have got gains. Like that's not, that's, that's, that's such a very ignorant thing to say mm -hmm. is that by changing your training up, you're not going to get anything. That's, that's just, uh, that's very narrow minded. So I know adding this high intensity to my volume, I'm going to get gains and it's also vice versa. Which one long-term is better? I mean, I don't know. We're never going to do studies on that. Yeah. We just count Sandow's and then we think that that <laughs> is the science alone. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you look at Ronnie, Ronnie's training was very, very different. He trained everything twice a week, very high volume. I, I, in my heart of hearts, don't believe Ronnie could have looked any better, but if you believe Dorian, in his uh, philosophy that the, the HIT style training is superior and you'll get better results. Uh, he would probably say Ronnie could have looked better, but I don't think a human Ronnie could have possibly looked any better the way he trained. And we're talking about the genetic elite of the elite of the elite, but still I think every training style has value. As long as you're training hard, connecting with the muscle, you know, you, you've, yeah, exactly. many, you've trained many different ways. That's why the bro science, the bro science doesn't work because for every example you say doesn't work, there's somebody to prove it wrong. I mean, look at Johnny Jackson and Branch Warren. I mean, if I was if I was to raise kids and I was going to put them into a gym, I would literally say to watch their videos so you know exactly not what to do. <laughs> don't do I that. Mean, don't bounce the bar off of your chest and do half the reps. But then you look at them, and is Johnny Jackson not a walking Mr. Olympia in his upper body? You know, he's yeah. probably had one of the best chest, best back, and still had some kind of – like he had like a almost Ronnie back with like a Tony Freeman waist. And it was like a little bit of everyone, and I don't know what probably happened from powerlifting or stuff like that with his legs. And then you have Branch, who is – probably one of the top white bodybuilders ever, you know, like a blue collar look, but uh, so exactly, you know, we, we, we're never, we're never going to be able to be like, Oh, this one was right. Or this one was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Johnny. I, I talked to Johnny not that long ago in an interview situation and, and he has no injury. You believe he has no injuries, no aches, no pains. He's pain-free. It boggles my mind. Look at branch. I think he's doing fine too. I, di I didn't know that. That's incredible because it's way crazier for him doing all his powerlifting and not having those issues. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. But yeah, he's another one. He's very happy when you see him at the expos. He's, he's very content with his life. Um, it's very hard to do. Yeah. I want to get into your uh, career a little retrospective. But first, because you brought your dad up and I'm not going to go into I, I'm not going to ask all about your dad. That's we've done that before. I'm just <laughs> curious when you talk about the gear, if you're comfortable I'm just curious. I, I am. I always believed he was on a very moderate compared to what the modern guys use. I bet your dad was using what like a figure girl uses now or less. Am I correct? Yeah, it's got to be. I mean, they did. I mean, he wanted he wanted a Mr. Olympia when there was no injectables. It mm -hmm. was just orals. Wow. And then the injectables came in a little bit, I think, right after. But yeah, I mean, that alone is is crazy to think doing a show and you're just chewing deep ball pills that's all there was right i mean i i know these things like yeah i don't think injectables came around until the very late 60s to my knowledge so yeah exactly your dad was probably on like 50 milligrams of d ball a day that was his mr olympia cycle the, the, i mean testosterone is testosterone right testosterone is what you use with it you know your recovery obviously it makes you a little bit stronger but it's the gh the most that i could never imagine my dad taking gh and what he would have looked like yeah. uh, i think he would have been able to train longer i mean just the just the recovery aspects of gh alone i think it would have made him look so much crazier um but if my dad had actually did one two diets because he dieted once if he would have did <laughs> if he would have dieted twice in his yeah. life that would have been more um beneficial for him than comparing what drugs or these machines are out now today uh, because we got to see muscle definition from a guy who drank soda and did zero cardio. My dad has never stepped on a cardio machine in his entire life. Wow. And, and I think those are more of the things that are more of a wow to me 
than like, oh, you know, because people always want to tell me all the time. As soon as I, as soon as I post some, some machine, some new machine, or I use the stim machine sometimes, it's like, oh, well, your dad didn't, your dad didn't use that. What if he did? Yeah, That's what I'm saying. I mean, it, and you know, I, I know you started out much thinner. I, I don't know what. Do you even know what he looked like before weight training? Yeah, he was skinny too. Yeah. But I don't know if he was skinny because that was his genetics or just because they're so poor in Cuba that they don't even have food. True, true. No, it's 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 cuz you know your early your early pictures it was your transformation was incredible. I'm looking for some old pictures, but you were you were a thinner guy when you started competing. I think you were like 170 pounds at 6 foot something yeah, like that. Some, yeah, middleweight, yeah. Uh, 170. Um, yeah. Tremendous gains. Yeah, I, I we'll move on, but um, I want to know what the injury situation. How's your shoulder? Was it diagnosed? Was it something you needed surgery for? No, it's not even. That was the, I. It sounds weird, but I almost was hoping that they were going to tell me what was wrong with it, so I could know and start working on it. But it's just like an impingement where it just gets stuck. Uh, but the x-rays and MRI were negative and, uh, I've been going to a bunch of specialists, but most of the specialists are so used to unflexible bodybuilders. Hmm. So they always are like, oh, I know what your problem is. And then they want to stick their fist in my armpit and my lat, or they think I'm just like tight, you know, in the back and the rhomboids. So I just keep going to people and trying to tell them that's not what it is. I mean, I can, I can, I can reach around and grab my you know, my hands behind my back. So it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. It's like whenever I try and do front double, it gets stuck and I can't pull it back. So this one, that's as far back as I can pull it. Wow. So I can do, I, I've been doing shoulder press like this, which is fine. Uh, I've had to change a couple things on chest, uh, but I still can't do a regular lat pull down leaning forward. I have to lean back. Mm. Um, but uh, I do think Vegas is the spot. Uh, I will find someone because everyone knows somebody, you know, it's just going to take trial and error of me to find someone. But I mean, I guess I should be happy that it's not anything serious. It's, it is fixable. Um, it's just annoying because I, what I really wanted to do, Ron, is I wanted to hop in, wanna, I wanted to qualify for the Olympia. But then I forgot that the cutoff is September. So again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into a show with a new coach half ass or rushing it. I did that the last two shows. When I did Legion and lost to Clarita, it was because I was so mad about the Arnold. I just wanted to do one more show before the end of the year. But I wasn't I had a torn meniscus. I, I was barely training legs. I definitely should not have been doing that show. And then the cow, the cow was the dumbest mistake ever. I mm -hmm. I, I I thought just because I got that travel ban taken off on me in Dubai that I should rush and go hop into a show. I should have just left Dubai, came back to the States, chilled for like a month, let my body just go back to being normal without stress, and then do a show. So that's going to be something that's always going to bother me about my last set, um, my last shows with Aceto is they weren't any normal stress preps. Mm -hmm. You know, you're obviously you have regular stresses, and I had a bunch of additional stresses that no no coach could ever fix. There's no coach in this world that could have fixed the cortisol that was going through my body uh, after that whole Dubai fiasco. So mm -hmm. I'm definitely not going to go into a show with my new coach, uh, just trying to hop in just to make other people happy. I'm not trying to please any more people in this sport. As long as my sponsors are happy, then I don't give a shit anymore. So. I'm not going to hop into a show right before um, to get the get the uh, qualification. So what I really wanted to do, Ron, is I wanted to hop in like the Romania or one of the shows that are after the Olympia so I can be qualified, have that out, um, and not have to worry about it. But if I can't do a fucking front double, then I don't even know how to pick a show, you know? Mm -hmm. But regardless, no matter what, because I'm sure that's the next question, is, is I'm going to do the Arnold uh, in Ohio next. I mean, why wouldn't you? This the fact that they've the prize money. Let's go to the Arnold footage. I'm showing people your pro debut. This was two years. You turned pro in 2015. You won the nationals. This was your pro debut, which you won, which not many guys can say they've done. Tremendous conditioning for your first show. I think what well, you were you you've gotten much bigger in the years after this. But what'd you weigh at your pro debut? I'm gonna guess like in the 240s, 250s. No, I won my pro card at 250. So I would I probably was 260. Okay. But just because of my height. But then, yeah, when I did the Arnold, which was, I think, my best showing, uh, it was just because it was, yeah, this. It was just because it was Bonak, Rami, Dexter. Um, <laughs> this is my best showing, and I was 285. Yeah. And, you know, two, yeah, wow. I mean, the Olympia that year, 
it 2020 you did the Olympia? Uh, no, 2018. I'm sorry. 2018, yeah. Uh-huh. So people would say, oh, he didn't make top 15. But that was possibly the toughest Mr. Olympia lineup ever. I, if you look at the top seven, five of the guys in the top seven were Mr. Olympia champions that year. Can you believe that? Yeah, Rodin. that's, that's back when uh, – yeah, go ahead. Uh-huh. So, so I'll read it off. So it's just people don't forget how good that year was. Sean Roden won. Phil Heath, Roly Winkler, Bonac, Curry, and Rami, and Dexter. So five out of the top seven were – either had already been Mr. Olympia or would be Mr. Olympia. It was a like stack. So what we're looking at right here was your Arnold Classic 2020 best poser. Arnold was going bananas over you. <laughs> look at the way he's i mean he's just the nostalgia you could see he's having like flashbacks although your dad never could move like that as far as i recall <laughs> <laughs> my dad was actually a horrible poser yeah he was like, well, his, most of them were back then <laughs> yeah arnold arnold would make fun of him because he'd talk about how he would shake when he would pose uh, yeah. but he still invented a pose so that's pretty cool yeah it's pretty it's, when you see other people do that pose, do you kind of get miffed sometimes, especially if they don't do it right? I just get miffed when they call it the victory pose because it's not. And if I bend my arms yeah. at the top, everybody has big arms. It's because <laughs> the arms are straight that the, the pose is so hard. And then your legs need to be straight down. What they do is they try and do like a classic where they twist yeah. and have their legs turn. So realistically, the only people who have done the victory pose uh, correctly is Brandon besides mm. Lee, besides Lee Priest, of course. Lee Priest, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's the toughest. Po- I I when I see people with, you know, I'm I'm a guy with shit arms. So when I see other people with shit arms try to do that pose, I cringe. Like, no, bro, no, do not do that pose. It just points out you have to have massive, full round arms to put them straight up, and they don't look skinny, fully extended. So you and Lee Priest are like two of the only guys that pop into my head with. The arms to throw that. Of course, you need the V taper. You need everything, but it's not a pose for those with average arm development. Here we go. Is, is it coming? I think the pose is coming. Nope. I think I ended it with that pose. Yeah. I mean, but to, to their defense, I mean, I have no business hitting it either. My waist is is nowhere near the size of uh, Brandon Curry's or my dad's. But, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, I hit it for different reasons. But, you know, no matter what, it's it's cool that people can try and emulate the people that they got into the sport. You know, like it's really cool. I just don't like when they change it and then they say, "Oh, well, it's the same thing." Yeah, I could yeah. see that. Yeah, man, this was a great show too. Sixth place here. This is this is probably the worst I've ever looked. Besides really? the cow, besides really the cow. Wow. the cow, the cow was really bad. Well, the cow you just jumped off a plane like the day before from Dubai, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, but it's just one of those things where I have high expectations for myself. I mean, I've, I've only placed in the top three of every show I've done except the Arnold, yeah. but it's more that I should be winning the show. You know, that's, that's the problem. Yeah. I mean, that's, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go through your contest history because so you've been a pro for nine years. Now you won your pro card. Well, it's a little less than nine years, but let's call it nine years. You've only done nine shows. Am I right? It, that's what I got here. New York Pro was your debut. You won that. 2018, Chicago and Tampa, they were like two weeks or a week or two. They were like a week apart, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Those were, uh, God, those were like heartbreaking for me to be there and watch because it's one of those things where it could have gone either way. It was uh, Lockett beat you in Chicago. And then Alexa Rivera, what's his name? Yeah, yeah. Uh When it could have gone either way and you just lost a week before, if I'm a judge – and it's a flip of the coin. I'd be like, ah, let's give it to Sergio. I, I would if 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 it's if it's like a tie in my mind. And I've been to shows where it was a tie, and those were the yeah. The, 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 the Chicago the Chicago second to lock it was rough because uh, that guy's conditioning from the back was insane. But he's still missing body parts. You know, he had he had injuries and stuff like that. So that one was really hard for me to to handle. Uh, but in Tampa, honestly, Tampa besides New York. And when I, I was there when Jay beat Ronnie, that was the loudest, most insane crowd I have ever been to. And for people that 
it was a long time ago, so nobody remembers that. Uh, it was right after the um, the oh, hurricane, yeah. the hurricane that hit Puerto Rico. So they like shipped in half of Puerto Rico <laughs> into that show, and of course, Alexis is Puerto Rican, and then I'm mm -hmm. Cuban. So mm -hmm. it was just so insane. Like I, I was, we were both getting such goosebumps. Like I, I died out like ten times in that show, but the crowd gave me so much energy being able to compete with him, and. That guy probably had the best legs in bodybuilding uh, at that time, you know. I mean, don't count Rami. Uh, so losing to someone like that who has just such a crazy body part. Um, and the same thing I said to him when we realized they brought us both out, just the, the two of us. He had got second place at another show, and I had got second at the Chicago. We said to each other, no matter what, we're going to the Olympia because they were still doing the points at that point, you know? So two second places is going to give you more points. So it was kind of cool for us both to know we're going to the Olympia. We're both going to our first Olympia. I qualified before, but I didn't go. So we were both going to be going to the Olympia together. And, and I was going through horrible depression. Like, I had already tried to kill myself before Chicago and went through so much that – that's why it's crazy when like Trajili and so many people are like, oh, you're such a loser. You lost. People have no idea that I was just so happy to be alive and to be competing. And I'm still struggling with trying to be happy and, you know, do this. And the only reason I even did that show is because of the mother of that kid. When I when I found out when my wife was having an affair mm -hmm. and and he left his pregnant wife and me and her became friends. She's the one who told me you if you go to this show and you place in the top two, she doesn't know anything about bodybuilding. And she's like, I'll be in Australia. And she's like, if you do the show, you get to go to the Olympia, right? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, because I wasn't doing it. I told the CEO, I'm like, I'm done. I'm done for the year. I'm, I'm checked out. And she's like, you know, how cool it'd be that they ran off with each other, left us, and now you qualify for the Olympia the same year. Wow. And it's, and so either way, so I wouldn't even have done that show if it wasn't for all these things that are going on behind the closed doors. Mm -hmm. uh, I even skydived after the Chicago Pro because I was just like, I was able to weigh so small that I was able to jump. But looking back, I only jumped because I was such a head in my head, such a head case. I was so unhappy that I wasn't even thinking about dying. Or I probably also didn't even care if I died. Mm -hmm. So I was able to do all this, do the show. I went back to Australia. So, so much happened. I got to go to the Olympia and I got to watch my workout partner, Sean Roden, win, mm -hmm. which was just so insane. So it was such a great year. And I feel like that was such a win that unfortunately it was just that second place. Yeah. I mean, it's it, like I said, the fact that you've only won one pro show so far, it just boggles my mind. It boggles, you know, I'm, I'm not an ass licker or anything like that, but my God, you should have, you should have more wins by now. And yeah. those, those you know, shows I would have won, won the Australia Arnold. Yeah, that's right. That one got canceled. Yeah, I went out that. Yeah. There, right? Uh -huh. It was going to be me, Josh Narlowitz. I think Kukla was going to go. So we, we probably would have battled it out, but that was it mm -hmm. because because it was like a week right after the Ohio. Rami wasn't going. Bonak won the Arnold. He beat Dexter and Rami. Yeah. Dexter wasn't going because I asked them. So really, I was in the top to win that show. So then my life would be completely different. Now I win the Arnold Classic Australia. I'm coming back. I'm going to get ready for the Olympia. And my life goes a completely different way. But they canceled the show, closed the border, and I'm stuck there for four months. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. Before I move on, did you ever learn Spanish while you were in Spain? <laughs> Uh, not as much as I, I, I wanted to, um, uh, I mean, I can, I can order food like a madman, but, uh, but no, I'm still, it's, I, I didn't learn enough where I'm not embarrassed by my lack of Spanish to answer. No, don't, don't feel bad. My, my, obviously, you know, my daughter's half Cuban. She's lived in Miami the last two years. Her Spanish still sucks ass. So <laughs> it happened. So let's see. You've only done a few more shows. 2020 Arnold, fifth place, 2021, six, the Legion last year, still got third place. I mean. That, that's a testament to how good you are. Even when you're nowhere near your best, you still got a legit third place. And then, uh, I'm sorry, there was, there was a legion before that. Uh, yeah. And that's, we haven't seen you since last spring, spring 2023. Um, and we don't know when we're going to see you again, but man, you know, uh, I don't want to make you seem like you're getting old, but 40, because Sean didn't win his Olympia until he was 43 or 44. Sean yeah, Jordan? 44. He's got the record. Oh, 44, yeah. yeah. So he was just hitting his stride. And I don't see that. I don't see you burning out or anything. You haven't done a ton of shows where your body's just thrashed. Um, you know, you just need to get through the shoulder thing and is the ankle fine now. Yeah, the ankle's good. Uh, I can't do calves, so my left calf is like uh, I'm turning into like a Dexter or Dennis Wolf calves. Um, 
Yeah. But 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 hey, they're not judging those anyway, so who cares? Dude, you know what? If it was a cat contest, <laughs> there's a few Mr. Olympias that would never have, never have made it to the Olympia. And, uh, I would say they're but, nice. They're nice if you have them, but if they don't, if you don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I feel like I'm gonna. Uh, you're right. Exactly. I feel healthy. Uh, I probably have the healthiest relationship I've ever been in, and I wouldn't have met her if I didn't move to Dubai. So everything happens for a reason, and I learned a lot in Dubai. I mean, in Spain. So what if that is what's supposed to happen? You know, I'm supposed to come into this world, this bodybuilding world, and there's all these expectations, and then I don't do as well as everybody thought I would would have, or even as much as I wanted to. And even though I'm placing the top three, and right, when I do lose at the Arnold, it still has four Arnold Classic champs and three Mr. Olympias in it. Still, regardless, I'm still battling with them. And then now, what if now my leg is healthy? I haven't pushed any drugs really hard. Uh, that's the best thing about Aceto is that was something that he never did. Yeah. And now I'm now I'm in a place where I'm surrounded by a lot of good bodybuilders in this area. I have a new coach and I'm going to be actually working on my posing, which is something that I have. Um, it's funny because I can win and I will win the best poser every time I do the Arnold. Yeah. But in the man, in the mandatory I'm probably one of the worst posers. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because it's, it's different. It's different when you're posing to music and you can, I can plan my posing where I can do this pose, turn around, let my stomach out, take a break. But it's different now, especially in today's day. They work the shit out of you where they do it until you lose for yourself. Yeah. And that's just something that the only way to prepare yourself for that is to run yourself through even more of, I mean, it's like when you used to play football, you know, if you make training, if you make practice harder than the game, then the game is always the easiest. So me being out here, Joey Belt is at the Dragon's Lair. He's one of the best posing people. Uh, Joey, yeah. Um, Joey Belt. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to work with him. So I think I'm going to come out. My legs are going to be bigger because now my meniscus problem is not a problem anymore. I'm I'm so happy in my personal life. I have no distractions. I have someone who actually is really helping me. A new coach, no matter what, if you think Neil is better or not, my look is going to be different because their protocol is completely different. So me going into a show with Aceto where it's really hard on pulling water, where I flatten out and I do lose some pop if we don't do it right, I'm not going to have that with Neil. So no matter what, I think I'm going to look like a completely different person and I'm really excited. And it's going to be one of those things where if I do win, then it's going to be like, oh, everything was supposed to happen. And we always knew you were going to. So it's, it's you know, it is how it is. Yeah. I mean, you're in a good spot because it, this sounds awful the way, if I'm going to phrase it this way, but a lot of people have sort of written you off. They're like, well, he had his chance. He was this great son of an Olymp three-time Mr. Olympia. He had all this time to make good on that potential and promise. And he blew it, blah, blah, blah. So people aren't, most people aren't expecting anything from you anymore. Which you could look at that as a bad thing, or you could say, now, if you show up at the Arnold or wherever it is we see you again and you look phenomenal, whether you win or take second or third or fourth or whatever, but you just look phenomenal, people are going to be there. All of a sudden, they're on your jock again. All of a sudden, they're your biggest fans. And it's one of those underdog stories. Everyone loves to see somebody who was down, knocked down, get back up. Somebody who was written off, you know, the Rocky Balboa, the, the stuff like that. That's what we live for because it's drama. It's like a story. We love that shit. So okay. I hope I hope we see that whenever it is, early next year, next summer, whenever it is you come back. Yeah, no, for sure. Exactly. And I, look, I get it too because I see a lot of bodybuilders that they either fucked up when they were in their prime and then now they're still around. And you can see that their skin is just it doesn't have that elasticity. Their muscles don't pop the way it is. And it's not it's nothing like they're not they're not cheating on their diet. They're not training hard. It's just that their body's getting older. So I know that when people look at me and they they know they talk about age and this and that, they just don't know me. They don't know that I didn't lift a weight until I was like 21. You know, I didn't even I didn't even take any gear until I was like 25. And exactly people getting mad at me that I don't do a bunch of shows every year also is a benefit for me. You know, because look, the 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 thing that ages you the hardest in the sport, because everyone wants to attack the drugs and the bodybuilding is so unhealthy. But the 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 worst part about bodybuilding is the off season and prepping back and forth. Mm -hmm. The extreme stretching mm -hmm. your body out with tons of calories and then sucking everything out of your body 
that is what ages you more. And that's why a lot of these guys that are like fucking 10 years younger than me look like they're 10 years older than me. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be tough. But it's 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 the demand of the, of the career. It's really tough because when you get in the sport, you need to do a lot of shows. You need to make yourself relevant. You need to keep sponsors happy. You want to qualify for the Olympia. And sometimes that means you did three shows a year. Three shows worth of diuretics a year can age you at least five years. So that's something that I at least have – that I don't have to worry about. And I, I, I feel healthy and I feel happy, but honestly, that's what I keep saying. I think the, I think being in a a healthy relationship is going to be the most biggest difference. Mm -hmm. And I, when I do win, because I will, and I will kill it. People are just going to be like, Oh, it's just because he started training serious. People don't know that there's no, there's no one in the open class, especially who's half-assing training. There's people who could be pushed a little bit more, but the only people who think, somebody won over somebody else because of their training. They just don't know anything about bodybuilding. They've never probably even done a, a show before. Right. Because when I did the Arnold the second time, when I just, when you were playing it and I said that that's the worst I ever looked besides the cow, yeah. before, a week before, I was looking the best I ever had. Hmm. But I ate some cupcakes and some bullshit ass gluten that did not, was not what I should be eating. And then you spill over and you look like shit. And then people think that that's what you were looking like. And you decided, you know what? I'm going to hop on a show. Like that's not a thing. That's not what's happening. So uh, I'm excited to, I'm excited, of course, to prove people wrong, but I'm actually more excited that I don't give a shit about proving people wrong. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you're getting, you're getting older. I'm old. I'm significantly older than you. And I think one of the best parts about getting older that most people don't talk about is you stop caring so much. You stop giving a shit what everyone's thinking about. It's like, who cares? You, you, you're getting like a sense. You don't have it yet, but you get a sense of your own mortality. And you're thinking, when I'm like 85, 90 years old, however old I am, if I live that long, if I'm on my deathbed, am I really going to be like, wow, I'm glad I really worried so much about what other people thought about what I had <laughs> and did and what kind of clothes I wore. I think most people would be like, why did I give, why did I worry so much, care so much about other people? Because at the end of the day, you realize most people just care about themselves. They don't care about you anyway. They might make snide remarks stuff. They don't really care. So just live your life and do what you want to do because nobody gives a shit about you anyway except, you know, you and a close circle of people that actually care about you and love you. Exactly. Yeah. And majority of them are living in their parents' basement and they have a boss. <laughs> like I, it's a, No matter what, the people yeah. who talk shit about me work for somebody else. And that's always going to be something that I need to remember because I can't imagine working an office job. Monday comes around and you have a bad case of the Mondays <laughs> while I getting to train and work out and travel the world for a living. And it's something that we need to remind ourselves because bodybuilding makes you be unhappy because that's how you have to be good. You have to, nothing's ever good enough. You only see the things that you're lagging in. You never appreciate, you know, the good body parts that you have made come up. It's just always like, oh, well, I don't have this, or I don't have that. While the whole time, exactly, you don't have some boss yelling at you. You don't have to clock in for work. I don't have to request for paid time off or to go on vacation. And I've traveled to so many countries and got paid to travel to them. And that's something that I really tried to get on myself in the last two years is really trying to be in the now. And when I talk to all the old the old cats in the sport, they all say the same thing. They all say, enjoy it, enjoy it. And when you're in the sport, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I'm enjoying it. But now when you start to get older, you start to realize what they're talking about is because they did they did it their whole entire life and then they didn't enjoy it. And now they're kind of envious of watching other people coming up and living their lifestyle. You go to Gold's, Gold's and Venice is filled with a bunch of people that were going to be Mr. Olympia and mm-hmm. they never were. And people might look at them and be like, oh, you know, you look down on them or you might like feel bad for them. But really, they are such a good reminder and they have such good advice. And those are the people that, you know, not the back in my day, I used to bench, whatever, but the real, the real guys in there. And and their advice is really the stuff that we need to be listening to because there's like there's there's gotta be no sport like bodybuilding where you're just so miserable the whole time and you're just told that you're not good enough and nothing's good enough. And then when you do win, it's like, oh, you still got to be bigger and you still got to do this. And then when it's over, you're just like, holy shit, I didn't even enjoy it one time. Because you can be backup bench player on basketball. You're still making a ton of money. You still get to go to those parties. Yeah. You know, you don't have to cut carbs. You don't have to pull water out of your body. You're not going through any part of your life where you uh, seriously feel like your body is dying. Like you literally are dying. 
and uh look i'll trade i'll trade the paycheck for a, a backups paycheck but we do get to do something that's really rare I, I just, that's why we can't compare it to any other sport we try fans try and try it all the time and it's like oh you know you can't talk bad about bodybuilders because when LeBron misses a shot. You go, oh, you suck. It's like the same thing when you don't win a show. Someone says you suck. Yeah, but we're fucking poor. We're not making any of that kind of money. True, you know? it's true. Yeah, so. I mean, it's it's the only sport, one of the only professional sports I can think of where you have to love it because for the vast majority of guys, even at the pro level, there's there's just no money in it. They're spending money to be bodybuilders. They're not making money. Hundred percent. A whole other, it's a whole other story. A whole other. Exactly. <laughs> Man, you've uh, you've been so generous with your time, Sergio. It's been great catching up with you. Appreciate it so much. Uh, I'll follow you guys. Give them a follow. And I think your YouTube is Sergio Oliva Jr. as well. Yeah, I need to get back on the YouTube. That's definitely something that I uh, I don't utilize. But I just can't be a regular bodybuilder. That's my biggest problem when that's what people want to watch. I did, I did a bunch of, like, skits and uh, – videos on youtube or i try to like make it funny and do all these different types of things and it's like barely any views it took so long so mm -hmm. so long to film so long to edit mm -hmm. and then there's like one of me on youtube of a day of eating where it's just almost like smr where it's really close you can hear me chewing it's like two thousand. i mean two million views yeah. i'm just chewing my food so i need to not be my dad my dad was anti-technology anti-anything new and i started to catch myself being like that too where i'm like i'm not gonna worry about that fucking youtube i don't care but i'm the one missing out on the money i'm the one who's missing out on all that money and if all i have to be doing is filming filming me talking to you people want to see that and uh that is something that we definitely take for granted because imagine if when we were getting into bodybuilding and you got to see like lee haney you know like at his house getting ready for a show or like whatever he's going through it's it's it's, it's something that i definitely would have been watching I definitely would have been watching all day, every day. So when I'm on my end, I'm like, oh, I hate social media and I hate this. I need to remember that if it was vice versa or flipped around, I would definitely be watching. But, Ron, I appreciate your support my whole career from seriously from the beginning. Uh, there's a lot of the MD guys that definitely did not have my back. And even when they probably gave you shit for even sticking up for me, you still did. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And people don't know, you don't make any fucking money from this. Like, it's a very rare that you're going to make money and it just shows that you love this because even though MD is done, you are still doing it. And really, honestly, a majority of people only even cared about MD because of people like you, the people who actually were actually going to the shows and being the face. So I appreciate you and I appreciate the interview that you do because even when you interview other people, I noticed that you watch their other interviews. So you don't ask the same shit. And that's something that's just very hard to do because you want to get the gotcha questions and you want to get the the sound bites that are going to get you the most views when realistically the interviews that you do are probably the most real and uh i, I appreciate that thank you for saying that well on that note guys if you like my channel this doesn't cost you a damn thing but it helps you me out so subscribe like share and ring that bell thank you guys for watching awesome interview and i say awesome because it's always great talking to you, Sergio. The great Sergio Oliva Jr. You'll be seeing him again. Don't know when, but keep an eye out. Keep an eye on his Instagram, and you'll know exactly what's going on. So thanks for watching, everybody. See you right here next time on the Ron Line Report.